Hello, everybody. So, in this episode of Only in Japan Go, I thought I would use this time to help you plan your trip. Summer's coming up, and a lot of people have been emailing me that they want advice, they want、um, ideas, they need help, and that's what I can do. My qualifications as、uh, a travel doctor would be 20 years living in Japan.、Um, I have traveled to all 47 prefectures twice. I've hitchhiked the entire country twice, and、um, that's about it actually. Actually, that, that might be enough. <laughs> so, in the next、uh, 45 minutes or so, I'm going to answer your travel questions, and we're going to、uh, let me fix this lens here. I have a wide angle lens on so that you can see more. I'm going to answer your travel questions, and then hopefully we can all learn a couple of things about Japan and, and some of the things that people are, are interested in and looking at. This episode of Only in Japan Go is brought to you by Patreon. Those of you who are supporting on Patreon,、um, thank you very much. Patreon Only in Japan page now has almost 500 patrons, so those supporters make this a full time job for me. Thank you very much for that support. I love you guys here. I also have a postcard club. Every month I send out a new postcard to all of the supporters who give at a certain level, and these supporters are huge to me. And this month is my wedding postcard photo. That's just a picture. The postcards are on the way. So thank you again for Patreon for the support. If you'd like to support this channel, the information is going to be in the description, as well as all of the questions. If there's some meaningful questions in here that I can help people with with their trip to Japan,、uh, look in the description of this video. That way you can index and find the chapters of where、uh, these questions were asked, and then you know if I've answered that already, because then. This becomes a useful resource for everybody who wants to come to Japan. And that's exactly why I want to do this. Let me see if I can get the lens a little bit. There we go. It's a little bit clearer. All right. It's a clip on. It's a clip on. Okay. So I, I'm going to be trying to, I'm going to be doing these、um, Japan trip planning question and answer sessions for Only in Japan Go once a month. And then I will follow this up with, on Patreon for more intimate、uh, question and answers. So、um, those people who are supporters get a little bit of extra attention because they're supporters. And <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, that's a big deal.、Um, so this is the Patreon page. I'm actually going to go right now、um, to what you're watching. And I'm going to look at the questions that you write in here. Once again,、um, if you have any questions, About your trip coming up this summer or in the fall is okay too, but something about Japan, please message me with your question and, and over the next 45 minutes I'm going to answer it for you.、Um, very good. So let's get started. Let me look at some of the questions here. Boy, just the other day I was uh,、um, between two trains. <laughs> that, was, that, was actually, that was actually a really good episode if you haven't seen that one. Definitely check it out.、Um, here we go. I gotta find this live stream here on YouTube. So, those of you those of you who are now doing, here we go.、Uh, Blink TV 909, is Tokyo a city or a prefecture? That's actually an amazing question.、Um, Tokyo is a prefecture in a way. We call it Tokyo To. And there's the city, which is the center of the city, like Manhattan. Like New York City has five boroughs. Tokyo has 23 wards. And those 23 wards are um, um,、uh, in the center of the city. And then from there, there are cities within Tokyo's prefecture. And that prefecture, that massive land, is、uh, quite large. I think if, if you watch the Algashima video, which I made on the main channel、uh, last summer, you, you can see how big the island, the prefecture of Tokyo is. Now, we call prefectures in Japan Ken. There's Aomori Ken, Niigata Ken, Toyama Ken,、uh, Saga Ken, Kagoshima Ken. Ken is prefectures. Tokyo To is also like a government, it's, a, it's a,、um, similar to it, but it's a little bit different. Uh, Osaka, we say Osaka Fu.、Um, and then there's also Kyoto. Kyoto is a city, but it's also like its own prefecture. So I hope that that answers your question.、Uh, 
Um, Tokyo is a huge, huge um, um, state, so to say. Uh, what, what should I do in Tokyo and Osaka for fun? Uh, Bloody Bricks. Nice to see you again, Mr. Bricks. Um, I like how your, your <laughs> icon is my face. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. That's okay, we'll let it slide. Um, you, you could, what you do for fun is up to you. Uh, these, there's some things that I can't really give advice to you, Mr. Bricks, um, uh, Mr. Bloody Bricks, because, um, everybody's different. This is the thing with giving advice. Uh, if you're doing it in Tokyo, I would go to, um, you don't have to go to Dotonbori, but I would go to, uh, I don't know, uh, Shinsekai maybe, and get a more authentic feel, because some of the restaurants there are really good and they're cheap, and it's kind of a retro, interesting feeling in in, in uh, Osaka. Um, some of the Shoten guy are really cool there. I went, I made an episode in Kyobashi in Osaka, and, and that's going to be coming up on the main channel the day, uh, today, tonight, I believe. Then, on the other side, in Tokyo, we have uh, Kabukicho, which is quite interesting at night. It just depends. It's, just, it's such a huge question. Um, I love... Uh, Ameyoko, which is an Okachimachi, it's a market that runs between Ueno and Okachimachi Station, and uh, that is a um, very interesting market that I think is, is worth visiting. That's something that's a lot of people don't, people seem to focus their times in Tokyo, um, and Harajuku, Shinjuku, Asakusa, Akihabara. I think you should start of go a little bit off of the beaten path, and that even means like Wayno is sort of off the beaten path. There's lots of museums there, but there's a lot more than just museums. There is a lot of markets, and the prices are a lot cheaper. That neighborhood around Wayno, especially Okachimachi, has a ton of personality to it. It's it's Shitamachi, so it's got kind of a, a rusty feeling um, from the Showa era, maybe about 30 years ago or, or more. 50 to 30, 30 to 50 years ago, so I really like that area the best. Um, so let's look at some more of these questions here. You don't have to do a super chat to ask a question, but I will see that first because it's so bright and, and uh, on my screen. I'm also not going to answer questions that are not related to travel. Um, William L. writes, and why do Japanese sit for hours in pachinko parlors? Um, is pachinko worth going to? I don't know. Uh, it is a form of gambling. There's no way around it. But Pachinko people will call it amusement. It's it's gambling. Uh, the people who are um, uh, in charge of them usually are in groups. <laughs> I'm not going to get into too much detail who they are. I think you know what I mean. Uh, so you can go and try it if you want. Actually, Sega World and some of the game centers have pachinko that you can try. It's Those are amusement pachinko. But if you go into the one where the people are actually sitting down for hours, that they're, they're sitting there probably because they're addicted. You know, So if you're addicted to uh, any kind of gambling, you'll sit there for hours and hours trying to win. Some people win. Some people lose big. But it is, it's essentially amusement and gambling and more gambling than amusement, I think. So I don't know if you should go. Hold on a second. Okay. That's <laughs> my wife. <laughs> uh, so let me get some more. Japan is a cash-based country. Cash more than credit. This is a really good question. Let me see who wrote this one here. Um, smart food. Great. Um, yes. When I first came to Japan in 1998, people had wads of cash. First of all, nobody uses checks, okay? So if you come here with traveler's checks, you could probably exchange them for money, but Japan is an extremely safe country. I don't know why you would need traveler's checks. Uh, the best thing would, would, to be, would be to come with a debit card or an, an ATM card and withdraw the money from the ATM card because you get the best rate as well as you get uh, uh, the safety of, of being able to take out the money anytime you want. 20 years ago, um, people carried around wads of cash, and I'm talking about like $10,000 worth of cash. My first experience was in the city of Okayama, and uh, I remember I was in an izakaya after, after hours working, uh, training to be an English teacher for this company. And we went up to the izakaya, and we met, you meet all sorts of people in izakaya, which is really interesting. This one old guy, he came in a jimbe, in a traditional Japanese, like, pajama-looking thing. It's like a uh, yukata, but it has short pants, and it's more casual. And he, he had it in his sleeve of his jimbe. He pulled out a wad of cash, and 
it was just all 10,000 yen notes and he just paid like this and that was essentially his savings he didn't trust the banks and there were a lot of people who just paid with cash nowadays people are paying more with um, I don't I don't know if I have one with me with IC cards they, the money has become more digital um, pe more pe people have credit cards than they did in the past Japan a lot of people did not have credit cards now they do um, so the country is moving in that direction it just takes a lot of time in general Japan uh, is a cash-based country and why this is important is because like I got a point card for like everything uh, let me see if I can get some more point cards here <laughs> like literally point cards oh, this is my Costco card I have hundreds of point cards uh, so are those worth getting if you're a tur tourist I don't know but if you're you do get 10% back or one point one one yen for every hundred yen spent back so it might make sense if you're here for a while um, but once again Japan is a cash based country cash is still king but I think you can get away with with credit cards more nowadays but you'll be surprised you'll be surprised at a lot of places where you can't use credit cards where it'll be cash only so just be prepared for that uh, it is a very good question um, Nico W do you regularly shop at Costco no it's too far away I wish I could go there more often but it's it's sort of outside of uh, the center um, I'm looking at qu questions what for travel here okay Richard Woodard says here here's a good question I've I've seen um, day trip from Tokyo Nico Kamakura or Enoshima that is a really good one Nico or Kamakura or Enoshima how about both um, Enoshima is an amazing day trip from Tokyo, and I made an episode on the Only Japan Go channel showing off the Enoshima Island Spa. I, I, I recommend that you see this because the views of Mount Fuji, if, if you've ever seen the, the um, woodblock print of the waves, like going like this, and they have all these fingers on the waves, <laughs> and then you have Mount Fuji in the background, that comes from Enoshima. And the, there's, there's a spa that you can sit in. It's like a pool. You can wear a bathing suit. You don't have to be naked for all those people who are shot. You can sit in the spa and look at Mount Fuji all day long. It's awesome. So Enoshima is really high on my list. If you like, if you like the seaside, then Enoshima and Kamakura are good. Kamakura is like a mini Nara. It's uh, underrated because uh, um, it doesn't get enough attention. It's smaller than Nara, I think. It doesn't seem like it has an, as many attractions, but there's tons of nature walks. So the Enoshima Ka, uh, Kamakura together is a pretty darn good uh, day trip. If you go to Nikko, that is, uh, you know what, you could do Nikko in a day, but I think that you should stay in a ryokan or a Japanese traditional inn if you go to Nikko. Um, I think that it's a, it, it can be a day trip, but it works better if you spend the night. It's a reason to get out of Tokyo, actually. And anytime you can get a reason to not stay in the city, that's a good reason. Right now, the city of Tokyo is undergoing a, um, a hotel crunch. There aren't enough hotels in this city uh, to uh, accommodate everybody, meaning that you have to book three months in advance to get the place that you want, and the prices are getting really high. And since uh, Airbnb just got slapped, this is important for everybody who's watching. Airbnb now has just been slapped by a new law saying that operators of Airbnbs, this starts next month, cannot operate one uh, all year long. That means that uh, they can only operate, I believe, at six months out of the year. So a lot of the places that are really great for Airbnb are going to be gone. And that means that they have to adhere, they have to register with the government, they have to adhere to the laws and the taxes now. And they also have, I think they had to do that before though too. And they also have to adhere to the, the rule that they don't um, work year round because the hotel lobby was very strong petitioning the government to, to add this rule. So that kind of makes it more difficult for us um, if you want to find an affordable hotel in the city. Um, for day trips, Nico is awesome, but I think you should spend the night. Enoshima and Kamakura are awesome day trips, but once again, like, you're going to be tired. These are long days if you're doing day trips. You're going out early in the morning if you're going to Kamakura. You don't want to go out there in the afternoon because it's such a hike to get out there. You want to spend some time out there. Really enjoy it. Sit in a restaurant or a cafe with a beautiful view. You don't get those kinds of things inside the city of Tokyo, and that's 
that's I think when you start to appreciate Japanese culture, when you feel inside of nature, that is that is the, that Zen feeling of of being in Japan. I think that a lot of people are looking for. You don't find that very much in Tokyo. All right, let's see what we got here. Um, questions on traveling. Bloody bricks. Well, bloody bricks. You got some good questions here, my friend. How much money should I bring for a one month stay? Um, that's up to you, bloody bricks. Um, I didn't like saying that. Uh, it, you can live like king with 10,000 bucks a month or more, or you could live very reasonably with, um, I don't know, like 500 bucks. And there's places that you can stay like, um, um, some very affordable like manga kisa or manga, manga cafes. You can stay there for like 15 bucks a night. And uh, some people do that. The working poor do that. They'll use the manga cafe as their hotels. Uh, it's been famous, famous stories about it. Uh, but yeah, 15 bucks a night in a manga kisa or an internet cafe. You can just, it, the, the chairs kind of go back like uh, first class on an airplane. If you can sleep in first class on an airplane in a chair like this, I think you can sleep pretty well at a manga cafe or at a, um, some of the capsule hotels that have lounges uh, that you, instead of a capsule, you can just stay in a chair like this. They exist and they're like 15 bucks a night. And I think that's, that's a pretty good deal. Um, you also have access um, to a spa and a bath. So it's essentially like a, ho a community hotel. Um, so 15 bucks a night, what is that? That's about 450 bucks a month, right? Plus food, yeah, I'd say you could live about a thousand bucks a month, um, but you're not living well. I can't live that bad, that that raw. <laughs> I don't know other way to say it. It's pretty harsh. If you want to live on the cheap, but you can do it. My advice to you, get a job and work and pay rent, and then uh, you don't have to live like that. Cause it's very hard to live like that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, there, gosh, I, I'm missing a lot of questions. I know I can't answer them all at one time. Uh, what do you think of the departure tax that Japan will implement next year? Dean, too. I'm, I'm not sure if that's that's actually... I think they're still talking about it. I'm not sure if, if it's going to be enforced. We're not sure yet. But if there is a departure tax, I believe it is a ca it's a grab for cash. Uh, essentially, they do that because they want to get money from... They want to get money. And they want to take advantage of the fact that their population in Japan is declining, but tourism is booming. And they want to get as much money from tourists as possible. There's no real reason to um, have a departure tax. But a lot of countries have it. And Japan probably, um, it's, still, it's still unsure if it's going to last. Uh, I think, I, I don't see any reason why they need to have a departure tax. I think that the taxes that they, they charge already is, is high. So um, that's my feeling of it. But... As as uh, this came up, they're discussing it, and that might be something that's either implemented in the ticket that you buy, so the prices raise, or something you have to pay on departure, but we're just not sure. So before we jump to conclusions, um, let's just say that it's something that is being discussed. Um, but I see. That, but it's nice to see that you're on top of the news. Uh, I'm looking right now, so if you have a question, write it right now. Do you know couch surfing? Yes, one of my friends uh, hosts couch surfers, and there is a community of expats that that do couch surfing. It's very cheap and it's a pretty affordable way to get around if you're part of that group. Um, I don't know if I should if you rec if I recommend it or not, but it is something that is here in Tokyo because my friend does couch surf. It's sort of cool like that. Um, just in time, um, is the public washrooms also free downtown? Uh, this is from Only in Antarctica. Thank you very much for the support. I'm seeing so many names that, that leave comments. So and Only in Antarctica, uh, you've been uh, commenting since like the hitchhiking trip like last year. So thank you. Uh, the washrooms are free. Do you mean like washrooms, like um, uh, toilets, bathrooms? Yeah, everything. I've never seen where you had to pay for it except like in Osaka in really tough places. <laughs> I think you had to pay. Uh, but I don't see pay toilets very much. That I see those in a lot in, in a lot of developing countries where you have to pay. Um, 
I, gosh, we have to pay like, I, I, I remember seeing them in India too. There's an attendant in there and the money that you give essentially supports the attendant. And sometimes there's a gate that you have to pay to get in to get, uh, go to the rest. We don't have that here in Japan. 99.99999% of the uh, restrooms or the washrooms are free. Um, the parks also have really clean washrooms. People take care of the washrooms. So they're, you know, th this is the thing. The reason why Japanese restrooms and toilets and uh, washrooms are clean is because people care about the next person. All right. This is a very important point. And I think that yeah, this has nothing to do. This has everything to do with tourism, I think. When you come to Japan, it's somewhat expected that you know, the quote, when in Rome, you know, you should do as the Romans. And what the Japanese do is when they use a restroom, I've seen people have these really nasty habits where they put the toilet paper around the side or they just, they don't want to touch anything. Well, Japanese are very clean in the sense that they probably have left the toilet that's public cleaner than the toilet in your house at home. They've left it as clean as they can because they think of the next person. Not everybody, but almost everybody does this. And, and when you, as a tourist, are the next person, you should also consider the feelings of that next person after you that's using the toilet and make sure that you cleaned up the area. If you did put the toilet paper around the seat, you put everything away and you cleaned up the seat because I guarantee you it was pretty clean when you got in there. Usually, uh, Japanese toilets also have alcohol spray that you can you can clean it if you want extra cleanliness. But they're very very clean. Most of them have washlets, and I was told that you should wipe. The, if if you're a kid watching this, you're probably cracking up. But you should w wipe before you use the washlet, and then wipe again because sometimes the washlet is so strong, the spray that it just splatters whatever was in there all over the inside, and it's it gets really messy. So I was told um, by my wife that you should wipe before you spray. Just a little bit of extra information, because not everybody has washlet toilets. I'm just saying. All right. Bloody Bricks, thank you very much for joining the Patreon Postcard Club. You're getting a postcard. Um, if, if you do sign up by the by midnight, um, you'll get the next postcard, which is coming out in a couple of days. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see here. Mount Fuji or Mount Takao? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Lancer.001. Uh, Mount Fuji or Mount Takao? And I'm going to go into some of these other questions in a minute. I really can't say. Mount Takao is a day trip. Mount Fuji is not really a day trip. If you climb Mount Fuji, you will be tired at the end of it. You will be tired to the point where your body hurts and you will know that you climbed a mountain. Mount Fuji is 3,776 meters up. That means at 3,000 meters, there's a possibility of getting um, altitude sickness. That means that you will be affected by the altitude of Mount Fuji and that means that it could affect the, your trip. You could have headaches for the next three days or more or even require going to the hospital. I know some people who climb too fast you have to go very slowly when you climb Mount Fuji. Mount Takao is not that high. It's the, the closest hikeable mountain that people like to go to in Tokyo. And it's very popular. And if you go there early in the morning, it's a beautiful hike. If you get there too late, it can get quite crowded. Mount Fuji, I don't recommend to anybody because it's so crowded during the hiking season from July 1st to um, um, August 30th. Those two months, those two months are so crowded, I cannot recommend it because it's not fun. It's really just, I wanted to climb it and I did it. That's the only reason to climb Mount Fuji. It's so beautiful to look at. Climbing it is not, it's like a line. Imagine being at Disney World, okay, an amusement park, and the line snakes like this to the top. That's Mount Fuji. So you're standing in line from the base and you're trickling all the way to the top. If that sounds like fun to you, Mount Fuji is perfect. You also have to pay a tax now, and uh, the price of the food is very expensive. The restrooms are are rarer. 
they're getting more crowded. There are toilets up there and you have to pay to go to the toilets. It's, it's not a nature hike. And in fact, one thing about Mount Fuji, and I'm, I'm not really high on it, even though it's a high peak, the highest. Uh, Mount Fuji, <laughs> yeah, I like these puns. Mount Fuji is boring because there's no trees. When you get to a certain point on the cone, there's no more trees in, on Mount Fuji, and it just looks like the moon. That's pretty cool for like an hour, then it gets boring. Okay, just want to put that out there. Um, it is a volcano. All right, that's pretty great. Um, see here. Shandy Town, limo bus or train at 4.30 p.m. on Thursday from Narita to Hilton, Tokyo. I'm thinking train has the potential to be faster than limo bus, however, because Shinjuku Station won't be fun. Uh, Shandy Town actually asks an awesome question, all right? Limo bus or train from Narita? And this could even go from Haneda. Haneda has, has very comfortable uh, monorail and uh, the Asakusa line is very convenient, especially if you go to Asakusa and Shinagawa. Um, the train, all right, if you have luggage, and, and uh, people always bring more luggage than they need. It's ridiculous when I see some, some of the tourists getting off. It's like, you could buy, especially in summer when you don't need a lot of clothes, you can buy all that in Tokyo or in, in Uniqlo for, and not have to carry your things. But with that said, um, the bus is always going to be the most comfortable option, all right? Comfortable, comfortable, well, however you want to spell it. I don't know how the English spell it. I don't know if there's a U in it, <laughs> like color. I'm going to say comfortable, okay? Like aluminum and aluminum. Um, comfortable. Now, uh, the buses, I, I didn't really take the buses because I always was scared to take the buses because I was always worried that the buses would take me someplace I didn't want to go. The trains seemed to be clearer on where they stopped. The, the fact of the matter is that the buses are, you put your baggage under the bus and you ride and you just look out the window and it's so relaxing and it takes you straight to where you want to go and then you can take a taxi. If you're traveling with bags, the trains stink because if you have wheels on your bags, you have to make sure that the wheels are not are rolling all, all over the train. On top of that, the racks usually on the top, when the train starts to get crowded, when you get into the center of the city, you have to take off your bags off of a crowded train from the racks above and that can be sometimes really challenging. And I've seen families try to get off the train and not, and th this is sort of a sad story. Half the family gets off the train in time and the other half gets stuck and they go to the next station. And uh, they could have avoided that by just getting a taxi because actually a taxi um, is a little bit more. But if you just pay $2,000 or even like $5,000 for a family to come to Japan, take a taxi for 50 bucks, okay? Take, a, take the bus into the city and take a taxi for 20 bucks or something. Catch an Uber. There's Ubers which run in the city, city center. Um, they're usually pretty good. Catch an Uber. Don't try to ride the trains if you can avoid it because it's really uncomfortable, especially with a family, um, especially in the morning and in the evening. If it's like, like uh, 2 p.m. or 10, 10 a.m., maybe you're going to be okay. But then again, there's a lunchtime rush at 12 and... and yeah, it's just really, really uncomfortable to ride the train. I, I'm always going to say take the uh, take the limo, limo bus. Uh, they're a little bit more than the train sometimes, but they're very comfortable, and they run on time. And the traffic in a Tokyo is not as bad as you may think. Okay, it's not as bad as you may think. Um, Trekkerus writes in. Trekkerus, it's very nice to see you again. Nice to nice to hear from you. Uh, preferred SIM cards for travelers and the best places to buy. Japan, I, I, I had to go through this because I, have to, because I have this phone, which I'm using the 4G, which is faster than my house Wi-Fi, by the way. Um, I had to go through buying a SIM card for my friend Tom when he stayed here in Japan. And the SIM cards are, are expensive. I was surprised, but they work really, really well. And he was able to download, use Google Maps Google Translate, and he, and he was able to use online services and get his email. And he had two gigabytes, and he only used half of that for one week. Okay? He doesn't watch movies or anything like that. He would look at Facebook every now and then, but um, some of the SIM cards, 
This is really important, okay? Some of the SIM cards offer free Facebook, all right? That means you can look at videos and use Facebook unlimited on these SIM cards. That might be the SIM card that you want if you're like a heavy Facebook user. For me, I'm basically quit Facebook. I don't use Facebook Messenger anymore. I'm basically um, have left that, so it doesn't really a big attraction to me. But if you're a Facebook user, some SIM cards have packages where you get free Line, which is the WhatsApp, WhatsApp app for Japan. You get Line for free, which means unlimited phone calls for free. Some of them have Skype for free. Some of them have Facebook. Some of them have uh, um, other apps that you might use, and you can use that and take advantage of that. So you get less b less bandwidth, but you get more services. That might be the way to go. Um, two gigabytes cost about $60 for Tom's and it's usually limited by the month uh, by the time so you can get two months two gigabytes for one month or one gigabyte for two weeks but usually that's more option there's something called a pocket Wi-Fi pocket the Wi-Fi okay this pocket Wi-Fi is a device that gives off a Wi-Fi signal it takes the 4G from Japan Docomo usually, but SoftBank and AU, the three carriers also have them. It takes the 4G signal, creates a Wi-Fi signal, and this device uh, is is very very convenient. My family, when they came for the wedding um, last in April, they uh, uh, had one of these devices, and the entire family used it. So if you have kids that are using an iPad and they're sitting on the train, you can use the pocket Wi-Fi for more than one. This works better than a SIM card. Now, that, this costed about 700 yen per day, okay? So that's about six six to eight dollars, depending on the exchange rate. Um, and this is for whether you want unlimited use or like a gigabyte a day or something like this. But if you want unlimited use, I think it came out to about eight dollars a day. And if, if you're a heavy user of the internet or you have a family, it's actually a better deal than the SIM card, it really is a better deal because you have the ability to, to use the internet on multiple devices for multiple people. The downside is that that pocket Wi-Fi router has a battery and you have to continuously charge that battery or you can get, hold on a second, you can get one of these batteries that, that allows you to keep the device charged. This came from a Patreon supporter, um, so thank you very much for that if you're watching, Keith. Uh, the, this kind of thing, uh, battery, it also has a light on it, uh, is very important if you want to keep your phone charged and it also keeps other devices charged like the Wi-Fi router. So you might want to carry one of these. You can get these in Japan too. You don't have to buy them in, it, in uh, your home country and bring them with you because they can be a little bit heavy. Also, while I'm on this topic, you can take advantage of Amazon.co.jp. You can take advantage of Amazon. While you're on the airplane or when you arrive at Narita, if there's something that you forgot at home and you need it, you can order on Amazon.co.jp and deliver it to your hotel if you're going to be there for more than two days, and it usually will arrive the next day. Amazon.co.jp. It's too long. Amazon Japan. <laughs> they can send the stuff within 12 hours sometimes because Tokyo is so connected and the infrastructure is so good that they can get you something to your hotel in 12 hours in the best case scenario. In the worst, it'll take about um, 48 hours, but if it's an Amazon Prime item, I've usually had it the next day, almost always. So you can take advantage of that. You can in fact buy your gifts on Amazon and have them delivered to your hotel and you don't have to go shopping, because I'm not a big shopper. You can ask my wife about that. She's in. She's tortured every time we have to go buy something. My limit's 30 minutes. I gotta get out of there. Just saying. Um, okay, here we go. Next question. Cheers from Tijuana, Mexico, John. Uh, I'm I've there on December with my husband. Okay. Uh, hope we can see you around. Um, okay, Eddie. Great, welcome. I'm, I'm happy to hear that you and your husband are coming to Japan. Um, I'm gonna be trying to do a monthly meetups. So if you can make it to some of the meetups, it's going to be good. A lot of people have been wanting to meet up, and I totally want to do it, uh, meet with everybody. The problem is I can't meet with everybody. So I'm going to try to do monthly meetups, or if I can meet you, it's just going to be for a short amount of time. Um, but it is, I, 
my feeling is that if you come to Japan, I want to be here to greet you, every single one of you. Because if you're coming to Japan and you feel that you're encouraged because you watched the show, that's, that's really important to me. That makes me really happy. So if I can be at the airport to greet you, that'd be the ultimate situation. And I did actually meet some people at the airport <laughs> and when, I, when I was at the airport, which is really cool. And I'm like, welcome to Japan. I'm like, wow, John welcomed us at the airport. What are you doing here? <laughs> that's what they said. So um, I, I want to meet with everybody, but I think it would be easier to do like meetups once a month or something like that. Um, and then uh, uh, tell people to meet at the meetup just makes it easier for me and it's easier for everybody because I can't I don't want to make a promise that I can't deliver on too. there's been situations where I said I want to meet with somebody and I couldn't that makes it real hard um, on both of us um, and our Dimitri Dimitri is one example Dimitri is a supporter on patreon who I, I met a couple weeks ago when I was shooting a video in in Wayno and he was so flexible. He made him and his friend made some time to come and meet me, and I was really happy about that. But it was really hard as well because we had to make the schedules um, meet. Um, so, thank you. By the way, thank you, Dimitri. Um, Brown Dog. Good afternoon. How's the wild wife doing? She's doing okay. She was eating cereal. She's kind of hungry, so I have to end this in 45 minutes. She said, but she's doing good. Um, in fact, we might do a live stream together and announce, um, you know, some news and stuff like that. Just saying. Thanks for asking, by the way. Um, thank you for the super chats. Mark Mendoza, thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you, Jim and Nosh, as well, for moderating. I appreciate you guys uh, each time. Um, look at the questions. I'm going, this is from Kahana Ohana. I'm going to Osaka tomorrow, Herb Garden, worth it in Kobe. Herb Garden. I went there to make a video with another company about three years ago, and it was pretty nice. Um, if you know, if you're interested in it, go and check it out. Uh, I think the rainy season is is starting in the next couple of weeks, so this is a really good time. Kobe is a place up on the hills. Um, it gets cloudy and rains sometimes up there when it doesn't rain in the city. Uh, it's kind of weird like that. So. If you're if you're going, you just make sure you check the weather report, okay? But it's 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 a pretty it's pretty neat to go to, go to the herb garden. Um, I don't, if it's worth it, that's up to you. I'm not I'm not sure. It's they they made the attraction. I I thought it was okay. It depends if you like herbs. <laughs> so, um, for some tourists, where can they buy dusk masks in Japan? Uh, only in Antarctica, that's another great question. Matsumoto Kyoshi has dusk masks. Um, you can get them at Daiso, the 100 yen shop. You can get them just about everywhere. Uh, these are, There's sick masks. There's also dust masks, which are a little bit heavier. Uh, those masks are available at Matsumoto Kyoshi, and I believe you can get them at the 100 yen shop. You can also get industrial masks at the 100 yen shop, but they might not be 100 yen, which is like a dollar. They might be a couple dollars. But you can get all sorts of masks. Japan is like mask kingdom, okay? Everyone wears a mask. People wear masks just because they want to wear a mask. I think some people are more comfortable wearing a mask. It's like, excuse me, sir, why are you wearing a mask? They really don't have an answer. They just are so used to wearing a mask. Mask man. It's like Batman. Except the Batman has a cooler mask. Um, let's see here. Did I miss any questions? I don't. I don't think so. Um, how long does it take to hike Mount Fuji from Cyber Zone? Uh, you know, that's a tough one. I think you can do it in one night. Typically, I've climbed Mount, well, I've climbed Mount Fuji three times. And the way I did it was I got there around 8 p.m. Uh, I kind of chilled out and, and uh, ate dinner there at the fifth station. And then I started to climb around 9 and I got and I took it real slow and I stopped at stations and had drinks and I got to the top at sunrise. You want to arrive around four o'clock, between four and four thirty in the morning. All right. The sun starts peeking through at around four fifteen. And remember you're at elevation when you climb Mount Fuji, so the sun's gonna come up just a little bit earlier. Four fifteen you start to see, four o'clock you start to see the first rays of light if it's a nice nice weather on the top of Mount Fuji. Sometimes you're on over the weather 
on Mount Fuji. So people, we, we can't see Mount Fuji on the ground, but you can see the sky from the, from the pinnacle of Mount Fuji. And that's, a, that, that's kind of cool. Um, but the first rays start at 4 o'clock. So just get to the top by 4, spend a couple of hours there, and get down. Because the longer you stay up there, the more you start getting headaches, and the longer those headaches will stay with you on your trip. Keep drinking a lot of water and stay hydrated. Um, that's extremely important when you climb Mount Fuji. Usually I'm back down by, um, by 1 p.m. And uh, I drink and eat a lot of water and food, and I'm just out. At 5 p.m. I'm asleep because it's just a, it's just a really hard day. That's a good question. Um, sorry, I missed it. I'm, I am trying to get to as many as possible, but they're coming in pretty, pretty, pretty fast right now. Um, Kahana, uh, Kahana Ohana, what do you think of the Illy translator? I bought one and will be using it for the first time tomorrow. I think that they're they're great. I think it's a pretty cool. I, I like the fact that it's offline. Um, uh, I think it's nice to it's a nice feature to have. I think that for most people, you can use the Google Translate app which is free. If you have a SIM card or pocket Wi-Fi, you have access to it. I don't think you're using the Illy enough to make it the purchase, the $200 purchase. I think it's kind of expensive. But with that said, having it is always going to be an asset because you have the ability to communicate more freely. Um, with the Google Translate app, you have to be online. It doesn't work perfectly. But here's the thing, all right? If you want to use the Google Translate app, you have to think differently. You have to, I think if you've been an expat, this is easier for you, this comes more naturally. You have to dumb down your English. I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean this in, in a way where you speak, you, instead of adding all these words you would in, in native English, may, just make it simple and the translations come out way better. And on the flip side, when Japanese speak, they usually make it very simple and it becomes a very um, easy for the translator to work like this. So uh, using the, the Google Translate app, if you start putting in like a lot of adjectives and things like this, it's going to get lost. Translation apps can get lost. Um, if you keep it simple and to the point, it does an awesome job of doing it. In fact, you can use um, the Google Translate app for menus, which is very important if you've got food allergies. You can take pictures of it and you get all of the ingredients and you can see if there's something that you might be allergic to. Most of the menus now are, well not most, but more and more menus are in English, especially in the city of Tokyo. And if you ask the service staff, um, you can say allergy. Allergy is a, a allergy. <laughs> These are words, you know, if you have an allergy, learn how to say allergy in Japanese because it could save your life. So you, you can ask if you have an allergy and, and say in Japanese what your allergy is each time. It's going to save your life, maybe. So don't, don't, um, don't put it on them like, oh, they couldn't speak English and that's why I got sick. You couldn't speak Japanese in Japan. That's why you got sick. And sometimes, uh, but for the most part, allergies, um, foods with allergies, you won't find them at family restaurants like Denny's or... Cocos or places like this, you won't find um, foods with a lot of allergies. They try to avoid those foods so that people, because they know that families um, can get sick from it. Um, professor, how you doing? Long time no see, Professor. Uh, hey, John, I'm coming in October. Awesome. For the first time, staying for 10 days and going to visit uh, Tokyo. Seki City. Oh, you're coming for the Color Festival. Awesome. The Hamono Matsuri. I made a video on that on the main channel. Check it out. Uh, that was a pretty pretty amazing festival. Kyoto and maybe Osaka. Uh, are these four cities too many for my first time? Great question. Um, I don't think so. I think if you're staying for 10 days, um, to visiting Tokyo, I think you can give it a few days. Kyoto and Osaka, you know, I, I'm going to be, I, I live in Tokyo, so I'm kind of impartial. I think that Kansai is a more diverse area. So I think you spend just a little bit of time in Tokyo and you spend more time in the Kansai area. Kansai is Nara, Kyoto, Osaka, all the way from Himeji, uh, Akashi. There's a lot of Wakayama, Mie. I, I think this is all like sort of the Kansai area. There's tons of attractions there. 
basically you could stay there. If you do want to come to Tokyo, just do it for a couple of days, but make in your mind uh, a decision to say, I'm going to be a Kansai guy or I'm going to be a Tokyo guy. And a lot of the stuff that you're going, professor, seem to be closer to Kansai. And Gifu is sort of in between. I don't think Gifu is either Kansai or, or is neither Kansai nor Kanto. Tokyo is in the Kanto region. It's neither one, either, neither one of those. I'm, I, maybe that's the Hokuriku uh, region. But it's very... Gifu in itself, you could spend 10 days in that prefecture. It's, it's loaded. Um, so... I think that that's fine. I'm I'm really happy that you're going to Seki City. There's also um, a couple of other cities. There's the Watertown, uh, Hachiman, uh, um, and the um, Monet's Pond, which you should definitely go and see. Awesome. I'm really happy to hear that you're going to that. Uh, Kyoto, I guess you, uh, you give it at least two days, okay? Give Kyoto at least two days and try to stay in a traditional Japanese inn or Ryokan. Um, for one or two days. I always like to say two days because one day you don't have to check out. You can just relax the, for the entire day. I, so I try to spend two nights in, in a ryokan if I can. But one night is enough. More than two nights, you get ryokan, ryokan um, tired. <laughs> I, spent, I spent over five nights in a ryokan when I did a video on Fukushima um, back in, which I, I released on the main channel in... Uh, uh, January and you saw those episodes in in November and those those episodes I, w I got Yokan tired okay so uh, more than two nights is is a little bit much for Yokan because they take care of you a lot um, really good Roland Roland also writes in with a super chat thank you very much for that this might not have been asked already but do you think it's best to avoid using Airbnb when traveling in Japan, especially now that Japan is strict about it. Uh, thank you for the live streams, Jap John. Love it. Um, I'm going to be on honest with you. And and uh, a lot of my friends have had amazing experiences with Airbnb. And some of my friends have had awful experiences with Airbnb. It just depends. Um, there was one Airbnb that I was going to have my family stay in, in Shinagawa. And... Um, later on, my brother told me he read the reviews and, and he said they were awful. So I don't know if... I'm a, I'm a fan of Airbnb because I think it fills the gap in a lot of areas in Tokyo where you just don't have as, uh, hotels. But sometimes it's the perfect option. Um, the family, what's inside? They make uh, an amazing YouTube channel where Lincoln and Dan cut stuff open. I don't know if you've ever seen this. What's inside it? Just a little plug. Shout out to their channel. Awesome, awesome, awesome people. Uh, they Their family stayed in an Airbnb in uh, Okachimachi, and, uh, near Okachimachi, near Asakusa. And um, that Airbnb was beautiful. They had an awesome time. Their Airbnb had a balcony on the roof, okay? And that balcony um, had a beautiful, uh, like, swing on it, had a place where they could lounge, and it was perfect for a family. The location was great. They could call an Uber, and the Uber would pick up the family and take them to short halls, which is faster than going to the subway station, because for them, they travel all the time, and they know that a taxi is better than the subway because you save time, and it's all about time management when you when you're traveling with your family um so i should you avoid airbnb i don't know um i think that you it might be it might be better to stay in hotels if if that's your thing if you can find good hotels if you can't maybe you go to airbnb to fill in the gaps but airbnb has some pretty cool and inter interesting places but some people should not be airbnb hosts as well and i think airbnb is still new in japan it's very new in Japan. So you're going to have a lot of beginner Airbnb hosts. I don't know. Just to check the ratings and make sure that it's it's something that, that you're comfortable with. Even if the pictures look good, check the user feedback. And if there is none, maybe it's best to avoid it. Um, Roland, awesome question. Thank you. Thank you for that. And again, thank you, Professor. Always, I appreciate that. Um, John, please talk about Sakura Housing. Um, Blue Gypsy Doll. Uh, the Sakura House is a place that a lot of backpackers stay in. At least it was the place uh, for short-term visitors, people who were maybe 
uh, staying here for most of the three months or work holiday visa, Sakura House. Sakura House um, now has competition. One of them is called Oak House, which is a little bit cleaner and newer and more corporate-y. It's run by corporations, so they have better properties in a way. Sakura House is also, I believe, they've renovated. When I stayed in the Sakura House, because I, I stayed there for an NHK episode on alternative accommodations in Tokyo uh, for a show called Tokyo Eye, uh, which I reported on uh, almost every week between 2009 and 2012, or, or every month. Um, now I do this. But uh, Sakura House was, it's filled with foreigners uh, from all over the world who were staying here on, on work visas or short-term visas and they wanted an affordable accommodation they could pay by the week or by the month. Uh, it's co-op in, in, in the sense that um, it's a community. I had some problems with it because people come from, coming from different uh, backgrounds, this isn't a complaint, this is just a reality. People coming from different backgrounds have different ways of living. This is something that you have to be careful about. So if, you, if you're coming into living in a community situation where everyone is strangers for the first time, it can be really magical and have lots of great situations and experiences. On the flip side, there's going to be some situations where the culture, and if you're not used to it, becomes very tough to deal with. Like with cleanliness, with washing your dishes. People sometimes would leave the dishes after washing it and then would wash it sometime later. There's rules to these sakura houses, but not everybody follows the rules. And that can drive people insane. Um, I know there are some people that were so happy with this kind of accommodation. Some people that were like, I can't wait to leave. Um, just depends on your background. If you're a tolerant person and if you're used to dealing with other people with different backgrounds, because it, it is a skill, something that I think you can grow up with. If you, if you grew up in a big family with lots of brothers and sisters, you might be okay. But if not, it might be rough for staying in a hotel, pay a little more, maybe. These are great questions. Um, let's see, let's see what else we got. Okay, photo Luke, Luke Hawaii, hey, aloha. And uh, I guess you guys are either in Japan or you're very close to being in Japan. Is is there a Japan website to search for events so I could plan? There's a video performance um, uh, there to video performances or shows. I'm going to show you right now. They do not pay me, but I love them anyways. Um, I used to write for this this page called um, TokyoCheapo.com. And um, two of my friends... Um, one of them uh, named Greg, I've known him for like 10 years now. And Greg is just an amazing guy. He's an entrepreneur. And they started this idea like years and years ago. I remember the first time they, I remember when they launched this. And uh, I, I write some articles for them. They have a section of, of top attractions and also things to do. And there's a tab right here that says events. This week, next month. June, July, August, September, October, November. The website has been operating now for several years and their events page is always up to date and it's pretty darn good. Um, so I, I'll recommend Tokyo Cheapo. The name sounds weird, cheap, but I think people are, are that are visiting Japan are always trying to save a little bit of money when they can to stretch it out. So I, I, I think it's, it's not a bad one. Even the first post right here is Tokyo uh, Cheapo weekend for June 2nd and 3rd, food, film, and fireworks. So you have right here, Mount Fuji, how to climb Japan's most famous mountain. They've got some really great articles. I think that it's, that, that's, I think what you're looking for. So I can recommend Tokyo Cheapo. The other sites, I think um, they're fine too. But I know the owner and I, I have some articles. Uh, I think if you search my name, let, let, let me just try and say, if you search my name, it might come up with some of the articles, Tokyo Cheapo. Search my name, John Dobb. Yes, there it is, Tokyo Cheapo author. And there's the articles I wrote. The White Strawberry, Square Watermelons, um, Vending Machine Restaurant, um, Onsen Etiquette, Meet Asimo, The Jumbo Gyoza Challenge. So I've got some, I've got some uh, nice articles for Tokyo Cheapo. So definitely check it out. That photo look uh, Hawaii. Also, let me know if you're in, t in town because it'd be great to it'd be great to see you guys. 
Um, and thank you for the support on Patreon, too. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, Tokyo Cheapo. Uh, let's see. Woohoo! We were averaging 50% 50, 50 thumbs up. Way to go. Thanks for all the help. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, g give it, give this a uh, thumbs up if you like like this kind of show and you like the information. Give it a thumbs up, and uh, I really appreciate appreciate that. We, we whenever I I ask for them, we like double the thumbs up. So I appreciate that. Um, Ken Tan, Jennifer is in Hong Kong. That's true. Um, are boarding houses still a thing in Japan for people to live in? There are still boarding houses. There are places I, again like Oak House is one of the biggest and they're pretty clean and they're and they're they're pretty good um sakura house is another big one and there's other ones there's weekly mansions there's japanese companies that have weekly mansions which are more autonomous they're, they're more um like actual apartments where sakura house is more like a shared living experience and i i gotta be honest with you i'm 44 i don't like the shared living experiences i'm selfish i gotta share right now with my wife and that's a good thing, because I'm we're used to each other. But I'm just saying, I people coming from different cultural backgrounds have different ways to live, and and uh, that can be a lot. To, you, ha you have to build into it. You don't know them; they don't know you. Some people want to be um, on their own. Some people want to be um, sharing, and some people just want to. They work and they come home and they're tired and they make a mess. And some people are loud, and yeah, it's community, it's community living. Uh, Cassie, here's for a midnight snack run. Have to head to bed. Tell your wife uh, hello from the birds. Hey, honey. Hello from the birds. The bird says hello. What? Can you say hello? Hello. There you go. <laughs> hello. Yeah. Um, so good night. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go in a little bit too because someone's getting hungry. Uh, do you... Do you like EDM, Ultra Japan Meetups? Uh, I'm not, I think that's some music, right? I'm, I don't go out that much, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I'm mostly editing videos. Uh, are a lot of people sick in mid-June in Tokyo? Habib Azir writes in, are a lot of people sick? Not really. Um, the sickness period is in February, and a lot of people are sick in February. Um, between January and March, there's hay fever. Um, between March and April. So people wearing masks might not be wearing masks because they're sick. They're, they're probably wearing masks because of the hay fever and the pollen making them sick from the trees, right? So uh, June is usually pretty good. Who's sick? I'm not sure. How accessible are the places for those of us a bit handicapped? Um, I have severe arthritis in my left hip. This is from uh, Kamome... May girl zero two one. I have severe arthritis in my left hip and lower back and can't walk very long. Um, and Sammy writes replies in here. Um, in Japan, in the middle, in the modern old Japan, train stations have no elevators. Research the stations to make sure you can't climb the stairs. Um, Sammy is right to a point. Uh, Kagome girl. Sammy is right to the point. Especially outside of Tokyo, there aren't really elevators. But in the city of Tokyo. There are more and more elevators. The this the, the for example this this station that I lived in before, uh, they didn't have an elevator when I moved in. Uh, they built one about five years after I'd been living there, and all of a sudden I saw construction, and then a week later there was an elevator. So Japan is very 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 this um, wait push Japan to the side for a second. Tokyo is very 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 aware that they're going to be under the scrutiny of uh, the world's attention, okay, in a year from now. They're working like crazy to make sure that Tokyo is more accessible. That means more ramps. That means more elevators. That means more um, uh, multi-purpose toilets, okay. There are more multi-purpose toilets in Tokyo than any other country that I've ever seen in my life. That's a good thing. Uh, Sometimes you have to search for the multi-purpose toilets or you have to ask for it, but they're there and every station has a multi-purpose toilet now. It's amazing. Not every station has um, um, an, an elevator, but every station has, if, if you're on a wheelchair, every station has now a ramp 
that you can that and the station attendant if you ask in advance and this is where um, Sammy is right if you contact Metro in advance or ask someone to ask the station like even five minutes in advance the staff will set up and be ready for you and if you come with a wheelchair the staff will help you from the moment you get to the station all the way onto the train and then when you you tell the staff when you want to get off the staff at that station will be waiting for you with a ramp to help you get the wheelchair over the gap on the subway and they'll help you navigate through the crowd the staff will go like this and say see my son see my son and part the crowd so you can get your wheelchair out of the station into the elevator and have priority over the other passengers so that you can you you can for for two reasons one because it's omotenashi and they really want to be kind to you and the second reason is you're kind of in the way too and they want to get you smoothly out of the way of everybody else as well so uh um Japan, I believe by 2020, will have an elevator in every station. It's my prediction, but as Sammy said, you should call it, call ahead. And thank you, Sammy, for, for helping out with that. I appreciate that. Uh, really awesome question. Um, the Midnight Snack Run, I'll be doing that um, very, very soon. Two reasons why I haven't done it. Number one, all right, she, she's, she's over there. Um, she cooks a lot of food for dinner, more than I cooked for myself. I'm not that hungry at midnight. I'm just saying. I gotta kinda skip dinner in order to do the midnight runs. The second thing is that my area, um, the places are closed uh, earlier. So I have to find places. I might be making a midnight food run to Tsukiji or some of the other areas. So stay tuned, but I'm sorry they haven't been able to do a midnight, midnight run because I've been overeating at dinner. Crazy. Okay, just wanna put that out there. Because I know John, John asked me about the midnight run last week, and I said I would do one soon, and I haven't followed through on that. So I, I, I will get there. I will get there. Faye Williams, grandmother. Grandmother Faye. Uh, I shouldn't say that too loudly, but I know that you're a proud grandmother. Uh, do you think it's a good idea to at least know some Japanese when coming to Japan? I'm learning to read Japanese, but some of the radicals uh, are so alike. That's true. Coming, coming Japan. Thanks very much for the super chat too. Coming to Japan uh, can be, you know what? If I compare it to when I came here 20 years ago, being in Japan now is so much easier as a tourist. 20 years ago, there weren't as many signs in English, so you didn't know you were in Shinjuku, for example. They'd had furigana, which is the phonetical alphabet, hiragana. And then the kanji is the Chinese characters. The phonetical alphabet, the kids could word it out. If you didn't re understand the Chinese characters, kids could say Shinjuku. They had that. But if you did, if you were a foreigner, you couldn't, there was no Romaji or Roman letters. Now, everywhere there's English. And that's really a good thing for foreign tourists that are coming here. Um, but, but, what Faye says is, I think, extremely important. Your ability to speak a little bit of Japanese will enhance your trip to Japan greatly. If you can read katakana, and I learned the katakana alphabet in one day, and I'm not a genius, I'm, I'm a normal intelligence. I learned katakana in one day using flashcards. And at the end of the day, um, I could read a menu. Kohi, coffee, pizza, pizza. I could read a menu, most of the things on the menu after one day. All right. And the second day, I studied hiragana. Hiragana is the other phonetical alphabet. I could read a lot of Japanese words or that furigana over the signs. Um, so in 72 hours, I could read katakana, hiragana, and I started learning kanji, meaning the Chinese characters, because the furigana helped me understand what that character, how you would say it, and then I could recognize uh, that. But Iku. Uh, okay. She's leaving. Uh, so learn, some, yeah, learn, learn some uh, phonetical alphabet. Uh, learn, learn the phonetical alphabets if you can. Learn katakana and hiragana. Make flashcards. Make them yourself because writing will help you learn, uh, help it stick into your mind. And by learning katakana and hiragana, even on the airplane, when on the way over, you will enhance your trip to Japan greatly. And it's going to be so much fun when you can see katakana 
all over the city and know what that and know what that character is. You're gonna like ha, ka, ho. Like you can be able to read these things and put the pieces together, and it it, it really makes it really enhances your trip. Um, I know a lot of expats that that have been here for years and and can't read hiragana and katakana, and I'm like, how could you be that lazy um, and not learn at least that? And uh, yeah, I am putting them down because you're gonna be able to read that. I just think that that should be a given. Great question. Uh, I'm going to take a couple more and then I'm going to have to end this. But uh, we'll be doing these once a month. Let's see here. Time to order pizza, John. Yeah, pizza. Um, Duolingo has a, has a katakana cards. Right, Duolingo is a really good free app that you can use. Uh, yeah, she left without eating. But when when I was doing the live stream, she she actually was eating. So it was, it's okay. Feed, but feed kanai, yeah. She could, she could always use a... Uh, you know what? People gave me super chats to take her out to dinner in the, in the last one, and I took her to a place. I'm gonna show. I'll show it to you next time if if um, if I do that. But uh, there's a place where, that uh, is really nice that she likes to go to. Uh, so th thank you for that. I probably will take her out after this too. I, I probably she probably deserves it. Definitely deserves it. Um, let's see here. There's a. Uh, you're lucky to have a Japanese. How did you get your? You're so lucky to have a Japanese girl. How did you get her? <laughs> uh, fate? Destiny? I, I don't know. I didn't order her on Amazon. Um, right. So, any more questions on traveling? A lot of these questions have to do with my wife. Not that she doesn't deserve the attention, but I'm here for you and your travel questions. Could you do a video on res um, residential architecture? That doesn't have anything to do with this, but maybe. Truly Japanese culture. Okay. Place to truly experience Japanese culture in Japan. Kyoto. Avery Lopez Baines. Thanks, you. Always awesome questions. Uh, right now, Amanda, who is a Patreon supporter, is in Japan, or she's about to go back home. She's very close to the end of her trip. She decided not to go to Kyoto. She got off the beaten path and went to a city called Kamaishi in Iwate Prefecture in Tohoku because she had been watching a lot of other YouTubers, I believe, that had gone up there and promoted Tohoku. Tohoku offers a very unique Japanese um, experience. You don't want to go to Kyoto if you want a Japanese experience. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Kyoto is a tourist attraction. All right. When I went to King Kakuji, the Golden Pavilion, which, by the way... I'm just saying it was a postcard on the on the on the uh, only in Japan uh, Patreon. When I went to King Kakuji with Kevin Riley last month, uh, this month actually, or in the beginning of the month, it was like Disneyland. I'm telling you right now, it's 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 really beautiful place, and there's lots of Japanese that you can experience. But if you really want to get to know the country and make friends and feel like you're in Japan, you can't go to Kyoto only. You have to go out to the countryside and just stay there. And there's programs, there's homestays, there's lots of different um, websites that offer services where you can get to meet people or stay in a guest house where the family of the guest house speaks English and they have a community similar to the T Tadaima Japan um, Ryokan that I featured a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Only Japan Go channel, the Shinjuku um, Ryokan. They offer an experience that's, that's like more local. And I think that's when you start to get a more Japanese traditional experience. In Kyoto, you have to pay like tourists. When I get when I walk around Kyoto, I can speak Japanese, conversational Japanese, um, and they speak English to me because they see a foreign face, and they're so used to foreign faces being tourists. Just putting it out there, it's a tourist place, man. So when you go out and you walk around, um, and I don't know if you're a guy, Avery. I'm sorry. I'm just saying. You know, like. It's for tourists. So um, Kamaishi, where Amanda is, is not a tourist place. It's a new place. It's going to be where Rugby World Cup is hosting some events for the 2019 Rugby World Cup next year. Kamaishi is an old steel town that is was affected by the tsunami in 2011 and the Great Tohoku Earthquake, and they're recovering. And they've got some attractions, meaning they have like the authentic living in the countryside experience. And, um, you know, Amanda po had posted some amazing things on the Patreon page. So I think you can check stuff out there from her, from her experience. But I think um, Hokkaido is a great place as well. Aomori, 
um, Kyushu, Shikoku, stay, getting off of the beaten path. Go to places where there's no Shinkansen, all right? When you come into Japan, fly, fly into Tokyo, then get another flight and go to Yonago. Yonago in Totori Prefecture, and that's where you're going to get a more authentic experience. And go live at Mount Daisen, which has a beautiful town that I think is worth spending time in. That's a traditional Japanese experience. That's worth it. That, I'm just putting it out there. Um, I'm saying I'm just putting it out there a lot because I, I'm just putting it out there, really. Um, these are wonderful questions. Um, best place to do that, Nosh. Photoluk Hawaii writes in, I had problems with the iPhone map app. I never use iPhone, uh, Apple's maps. I always use Google. It's better in Japan. Apple does not have a lot of things listed on the maps in Japan. So I use the default, is my default map is Google Maps, which is just awesome. And it helps with YouTube too, because I'm a YouTuber. Uh, he bragged your grandfather. <laughs> I know what you're talking about, Mr. Seiichi. I didn't bribe him, but yeah, that was, that's not a bad idea. Uh, I'm going to go see him soon, actually, uh, Mr. Seiichi. How can you get tickets to the Toyo Carp baseball games? Uh, you know, the Carp baseball games in um, uh, Hiroshima are sold out. It's easier to get tickets to the, um, to the Blue Waves and the... Uh, uh, Yokohama Bay, sorry, the Yokohama Bay Stars in Yokohama. They have an awesome stadium with craft beer and really good food. Um, I did a, a live uh, Only in Japan Go stream there. They're easy to get tickets. The Swallows in Tokyo. Even the Hunching Tigers are easy to get tickets. But the Carp, I believe, are very strong again this year. They were strong last year. I think they won. So uh, I don't follow Japanese baseball too closely. But the uh, um, how to get tickets is... Get them in advance. Uh, excuse me. Every single website, every single team has a different way to do it. Um, Yokohama Bay Stars. I'm sorry. The um, the Chiba Mar Marines. The Chiba Marines is is uh, in Makuhari, which is a 30 40 minute train ride from Tokyo Station. You can get the tickets at 7-Eleven vending machines. Okay, inside of 7-Eleven, you could get the tickets. To the, cart, um, to the Marines game. So every team has their own original way, whether it is on their website, sometimes only in Japanese, but you can use the Get Google Translate app usually to help you with uh, buying those tickets. Um, but it's never really easy. Or you can go, and go to the stadium a couple of days in advance and you can get usually tickets. It depends. Some series where the teams are strong, like when the Tokyo Giants go in to play a team, those tickets might be sold out because of the Tokyo Giants, okay? And we, the Hiroshima fans want to see the carp destroy the Giants. Uh, so it depends on who they're playing. If they're two weak teams, yeah, you know, you can get tickets right before the game. It's pretty easy. It's a good question. How is Japan in December? Is it a good time to go? Japan, this is a question I get the most. And this is a great question to end on, okay? Because we've been go I'm going in 20, long 20 minutes longer than, than I should have. This is a great question to, to answer. Um, so, Anjin-san 2020. I like that name, Anjin-san. Uh, Navigator. Any plans to go to visit Sato Island? Yes. I don't know if it's going to be this year. But Sato Island is a beautiful island in Niigata Prefecture that I highly recommend. They make awesome Japanese sake. Uh, Nihonshu. Uh, I do have plan. I don't have any plans to visit Sado, but it's a place that I want to go to very badly. So it's high on my list. Um, it's still cold on Sado. It doesn't start to feel like spring until like June because they have uh, cold winds coming uh, coming uh, off it. But they have a famous Taiko festival every year around this time. Actually, I think in June. Um, so Sado is worth going to, and that festival is worth going to. I might go to the festival. Who knows? Uh, thank you for that. Why not Japan in December, Melvin writes. Um, Melvin, I'm telling you right now, the easiest way to answer this question is simply Japan. There's no bad time to come to Japan. There's no best time to come to Japan because each time is a trade-off. You might think that the cherry blossoms is the best time to come to Japan. The trade-off is that hotels are more expensive. The trade-off is that everything is more crowded. The trade-off is that... Uh, it's still kind of cold and the weather is unpredictable in April. You get really warm days and then it gets down, it might snow and then it gets really warm again. The weather's like this in April. 
So um, the best time, there is no best time. The great thing with December is that there aren't as many people here, so the hotel prices are a lot cheaper. Um, th there's Kotatsu and Onsen. I love to go to the Onsen resorts in December because the cold air and the warm water, water feel amazing. Uh, it, it, if you're a skier, the ski resorts in Japan are top-notch, world-class. Uh, I would say that December has also its own original food. It's the end of fall. So you have some of that autumn cuisine, which is really good. A lot of mushrooms. Um, Japan has so many varieties of, of um, edible mushrooms that they use in cuisine. There's the um, marono, the chestnut, the um, kuri, which are very good. A lot of the, the desserts are incredibly delicious in, in the autumn and the early winter. So there's lots of really good things. Every season in Japan, all four of them, <laughs> there are four seasons, has an attraction. Basically, if you're coming in December, that's good. The next time you come to Japan, come in the fall, come in the winter, or, or come in the come in the summer, come in the spring. Try to come in four different seasons. Come every month because there's some different attraction. Whether it's a festival, whether it's the season, whether it's a, a campaign, uh, or some sort of a, um, a, um, how can I say, event or convention or a museum has a, a special like, exhibition. There's always something happening in Japan that is dependent on that time of year. December is just as good a month as any. The trade-offs are there. It's, it's less expensive in November and December. Now, the end of December is a different story, but the beginning of December is a, is a lot cheaper and the hotels are more available and you probably have a better experience, not as crowded. So you have to look at it like that, you know. Okubo and Shinjuku, interesting. Okubo is interesting um, if you like ethnic foods. It's a place where a lot of immigrants have settled, a lot of Korean. I, some of the best Korean food um, in Japan is there. Uh, Shin Okubo is a station on the Yamanote line, I believe. It's an interesting place. I think, it, I don't, is it worth going to? I don't know. I mean, I live here. It's always worth it for me because it's got supermarkets where you can get um, like Indian food and, and different Asian foods. They've got some um, Asian supermarkets there. So it's worth visiting for me. If you've got three days in Tokyo, is it worth visiting for you? I don't know. I, <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if your hotel's near there, it might be. Flying drones in Japan, am I able to? Brent W., great question. The answer is... Um, the answer is not that simple. I made a video on this that answers it, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell it to you simply. Uh, DJI has a map, and if you have a drone, most likely it's a DJI one, just because um, um, GoPro makes an awful <laughs> their Karma drone is a disaster. So DJI makes a map, and they also have this here. Here's the map. Uh, I think it's hard to. All right, let me see if I can get the the brightness of the screen down. You can see the map right here, okay? This map is the map of where you can fly your drone. Here's the city of Tokyo. You can see it. Let, let me see if I can make this bigger, bigger for you. Here's the city of Tokyo. Now I'm going to enlarge this a little bit more. Maybe that's too big. All right, here it is. The city of Tokyo is absolutely covered in um, in red in pink. Uh, here's the city of Tokyo. You see it? You can't fly your drone in Tokyo. All right. That's th this is where, where I am right now in the center of the city. This is Akihabara. This is Ueno. This is the center. All right. Here's Shinjuku. And even outside of the center, you can't even fly your drone. The reason why is because there's lots of other, uh, there's airports. There's lots of other regional airports. There's smaller airports. There's heliports. There's other, other, um, and it's too dense. It's very, very crowded. Um, this, there's places on this map that aren't covered. Like, for example, um, um, Kasai Rinkai Koen, right here. Kasai Rinkai Koen or Kasai Seaside Park. It, I wouldn't fly my drones there either. And even if, if it, it's not covered, I guarantee you it's covered. Can you fly your drone? No. But will people be flying their drones? Probably. And will they get in trouble? There's a risk. The fine is $5,000, okay? 
But more important than the risk is the amount of time you're going to be spending at the police station trying to get out of paying that fine because the police can hold you for, I think it's like three weeks without cause. In the United States, I think it's like 24 hours without cause if you watch like a Law and Order or TV dramas. In Japan, it's about three weeks they can hold you, I believe. I might, I might, I might have this wrong. You could be in detention. Police, you might sit in the police station for, for 24 hours and just sit there and do nothing. And they might ask you questions and make you sit again and wait, wait until some other police officer comes on the shift and then you gotta talk to that police officer again and sit there. They'll penalize you, not with money, they'll penalize you with your time if you get caught flying a drone. You're gonna ruin your day. So this is what you can do. If you, it, you can fly your drone outside the city of Tokyo, all right, in all these places, in Chiba, in Saitama, in the mountains, in Shizuoka, you can fly your drone if you follow these rules. 30, 30, 30, 150. You can't fly higher than 150 meters up. That's a rule, that's a law. If you ever get caught, the police will check your flights uh, on your drone. They're stored there. Um, the second thing is uh, 30 meters from houses, 30 meters from people, 30 meters from cars. All right, 30 meters from houses means all buildings. Cars and people, that also means dogs, if you can try. They, that's what they said. Um, so you want to have a 30-meter um, buffer, all right? Uh, the, the next thing that I have to point out was even though there's no pink here, you have to have permission if you're on private property to fly the drone. That's sort of a no-brainer. If you don't have permission from the farmer, you probably shouldn't be doing it, and you can get in trouble even though it's not pink. So, you can fly your drones, but I'm telling you, there's a risk, and you should be aware of those risks because um, not everybody gets away with it. I, I've, I know people who had to pay the fine. I know people that were detained for, and they ruined, uh, and kind of ruined their, their trip just to get a drone shot. If you want a drone shot that badly, buy it from somebody who took the drone shot. If you want to take it yourself, don't because the city of Tokyo, they have like, like a Jack Bauer type, um, uh, this is what the police officer told me. I don't know if it's true, but they said they have Jack Bauer-like tools, like CTU, where they can find drones and home into it because of terrorist attacks and things like this. If, if you're flying a drone, they can, they can hone in on the drone and the signal and find you, and then they'll find, find you or detain you. So flying a drone has risks in the city of Tokyo and Kyoto and Osaka and Kobe and Hiroshima, just saying, and Sapporo and Nagoya and Kagoshima in the city center and these places. I'm, I'm just putting it out there, um, but you're, a lot of you are going to fly it anyways. Um, yeah. So uh, that was good. That was a good way to end. Uh, I will be doing, what do I watch on TV? I watch Netflix. I don't have a TV. NHK, if you're watching this, I don't own any TVs. So I'm not paying the tax. <laughs> I, I'll pay the tax if you come, but um, uh, I, I, don't, uh, watch, I don't watch a lot of TV. Trekkerus, one an aerial shot of Tokyo. Take a helicopter tour. Trekkerus, you got that right. The helicopter tours are one-fifth the price of the fine that you would have to pay. And the helicopter tours are stunning, and you can and you and you can be inside the drone. Let's just say, helicopter tours do require a reservation, and uh, you have to pick if you want want it during night um, or evenings. But uh, that's something that I might do for the Only Japan channel, which would be really cool. A helicopter tour. Thank you for Trekkers for pointing that out. That's awesome. Um, any other questions? I'm gonna take one last one because I gotta go. Uh, my son will be moving to you. Can you, in December, suggest any sites for learning Japanese? Uh, Brian, I'm not really sure, but if you check Google, there's a hundred schools. The uh, I think it was like um, Kai and Kato. There's a bunch of schools. I, th I I can't really recommend it because I learned from a book. I never went to any. I never took any lessons. Um, so I can't recommend any schools. But I, I, you know, the schools are also a mixed bag. Because a lot of people, if you're taking group lessons, there's a lot of people who 
they see foreign faces and they just they they learn Japanese and then they they turn right back to English and you end up speaking more English than you than you speak Japanese. So um, you you have to really immerse yourself in it. That's why I say if you're gonna study Japanese, get out of Tokyo, get out of the city, and then you're gonna learn a lot faster um, because nobody to talk to in English. <laughs> what are good places in Tokyo for live music? Um, depends. Do you want jazz? Do you want rock? Do you want alternative? Do you want um, Kita? The, there's the famous places. I can say Shinjuku uh, has a lot of jazz clubs. Omote Sando Aoyama has the Blue Note, um, which is a jazz club, a famous one that's sold out and more is, is more expensive than the one in New York, the original one. There's the uh, Billboard Cafe, which has um, top artists in Rapungi. Um, there's, I believe that's in Midtown. There's, there's, there's Shimo Kitazawa, which has live music houses as well. Uh, those are more indie bands. They're really good. Uh, so I, I can't really recommend one, one particular place. Uh, but there's a lot of really good places. Um, have you eaten stamina taro? Uh, actually, I, I walked by there the other day. It, do I recommend it? Yeah, if you're hungry. <laughs> it's, like, it's, not, it's, it's decent ramen. Is Tokyo Dome Dome worth it, or are are the lions like Disney? Tokyo Dome, um, you know what? I think it's worth it because it's so easy to just just leave if you don't like it. It Tokyo Dome is in the center of the city. It's an it's an attraction place. They have a very amazing roller coaster, a jet coaster. We say in Japanese, jet coaster, roller coaster, and it goes through um, like a hole in one of the hotels. Uh, which is a spa, and uh, uh, it's a pretty good, um, uh, pretty good for families as well. Yeah, it's a, it's also right near the the Tokyo Dome, which is where the to Tokyo Giants play. So depending on the time of day, it can be really really crowded. Um, is it worth it? I think so. It's worth it. They have restaurants down there. That's where Peter and I did a live stream. We ate suke men down there. Um, so that it's a neat area. It's good for families. I think it's a very family friendly place. Um, and they have a baseball, the Japanese baseball hall of fame is inside the Tokyo Dome. And I think that's something if you're a baseball fan in the United States, check out the Japan baseball hall of fame. I think it's pretty cool. Um, Nosh can't sleep without a pillow. Nosh, I actually have your pillow inside my closet. Um, and it's yours, but uh, I might just give it to you when I see you, <laughs> which I think I, I should be soon. I don't know if Peter's going to sign it, but, uh, I will be happy to, I, my wife is happy as long as the pillow's out of sight. That's your lap pillow, brother. I, I, it, you, you know, you, you, you got it. It's yours. Um, so there we go. Um, there you go, says Jim. That's it. So thank you very much for for uh, watching this. Um, one, one last Abdul, I'm uh, sorry, Ab Abdurman Abdurman X writes in. Can you wear shorts in Japan? The answer is yes, um, but most Japanese wear pants, uh, long pants, especially in the city, even when it's hot. Just there's something about the city. Um, you want to wear pants, uh, so most Japanese will be wearing long pants. Younger people will wear shorts. Kids wear shorts. I wear shorts. I'm not Japanese. I'm wearing shorts right now. So, can you do it? Yeah, I wear shorts from like April until October. My friend Greg, who is, who runs the Tokyo Cheapo website, he wears shorts from like March till November. All right, he's from New Zealand. He's crazy. I don't go to that extreme. I have Canadian friends that wear shorts um, like from the end of February. They're like, it's just warm. So, you know, can you do it? Sure. Are you weird? Yes. Will people laugh at you? Japanese people make fun of you? Probably. Will you look like a foreign tourist even though you're a resident here wearing shorts? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because uh, it's weird. Um, there you go. So thank you. If you did like th this format, um, definitely click the like button even if you're watching this on the playback. Uh, subscribe to the channel. I want to have this channel Only Japan Go have this live interaction with you so that you can ask questions and we can have a resource for those that are planning trips to Japan. I hope this was useful. Um, this, I, once again, I have to, to plug the Patreon page because you, you guys who are supporting on Patreon give me the freedom to do stuff like this. 
without having to get a second job or having to search for sponsors because you are the sponsor. So thank you for that. Um, next month, I'm going to do this again. And when I do it, after I do this live stream, this one's for 90 minutes. It's going to be for only 45 minutes. And I'm going to go to the Patreon page and do one with, with less people. Uh, so if you're interested in coming to Japan, um, I'll, I'll have more one-on-one -on -one interaction. It's gonna, it, it'll feel like one on, like a small classroom instead of a, an, an auditorium. So uh, I, I do want to thank everybody who supports on Patreon, and the link is in the description as well. So thank you once again for, for watching this live stream. Thank you very much for the super chats and the support each time. I love you guys. Uh, I appreciate such passionate questions and um, asking about Japan. And if you do come to Japan and you want to meet up, I will try to meet you. Uh, I, I respond, especially if you're a Patreon supporter, because the emails are, are not as much as Instagram and Facebook and all the other SNS. But um, if I can't meet you, I apologize, but I will try. And uh, I will do some monthly meetups starting uh, in June. So that would be best to, to hang out all together just for an hour or something and, and maybe share a bowl of ramen or have a, have a drink from a vending machine or something like that. Because that, that could be a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Tuning in, I'll see you next time. In fact, at one o'clock, all right, guys, I have to tell you right now, my friend Hana, do you remember Hana? We started the Only in Japan Go channel um, on on uh, January 1st, in the beginning of this year. I started it with Hana playing the guitar and giving us a message, of in, uh, an inspirational message, a good message. And uh, she's gonna be here at one o'clock. Uh, and then we're going to talk. Uh, because we haven't, I haven't seen her for six months. She went to school in Canada and, and has returned to Japan now. So I want to talk to her about her experience uh, working in Japan. So if, if you if you're interested in that, stay uh, stay close to the live stream. Stay close to the channel and look for that live stream. I'm gonna create that live stream after this one, so you can set click a reminder button, and 30 minutes before the live stream will remind you to uh, watch that live stream. I think it's gonna be a good one. Um, so we're gonna see Hana again. And thank you again for the support. See you guys next time. I gotta get a, a hot coffee because now this has turned to ice. Nothing wrong with that in summer. Bye, everybody.